Another abduction in Zamfara State. Governor Belo Matawale speaks. And President Muhammadu Buhari rules out amnesty for bandits terrorizing the country. We'll be speaking with Sheikh Abubakar Gumi later on on the show. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. Zamfara State Governor Belo Matawali has claimed that Nigerians would be shocked to know those behind the abductions of over 300 female students of the government girls' secondary school, Jangebe. He said, and I quote, as we await the release of kidnapped students of GSS Jangebe at the government house today, I want to inform you that there are many revelations in relation to the abduction of these students. Many people will be surprised to hear those people behind the abductions and these of these innocent children. They are not comfortable with the progress I am getting as a result of my peace initiative and they want to do all they can to sabotage my efforts." End of quotes. Now, the Jangabe attack took place almost two weeks after bandits kidnapped 27 students and 15 workers of Government Science College Kagara in Niger State. Discussing with me this evening are uh, journalist Dikwa Olayoku and uh, legal practitioner Emmanuel Umoran. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Yeah, good evening. Thank you for having me. All right. Yes, good evening. I'm going to start with you, Dikwa. Of course, uh, as journalists reporting on all of these issues, you get more and more information. As of Sunday, while people were waiting uh, or visiting the governor and, um, you know, condoling with him as to... Um, or commiserating with him as to the people who were abducted. Um, there were stories that were flying around. In fact, there was a rumor that was almost um, acceptable to everybody that these <coughs> students were going to be released. In fact, they had said that this, the people that were kidnapped were released. It was a story that was going around on social media and in some different fora. Uh, did you hear, were you privy to this information? And uh, when you found out that it was fake news, uh, how did that make you feel? Uh, thank you very much. I didn't feel any different because um, I'm used to fake news. Uh, sorry, I'm used to social media and the tendency to spread the fake news. So it didn't come as a surprise. I, by virtue of my training, I, I, I work on what we can see before you can believe. Seeing is believing. So when the rumor, as it, you have described, started flying, I never give it any serious consideration until I hear from the people that are really concerned, like the governor of uh, Zampara State or the commissioner of police or any government official. So when you see stories on Facebook, uh, Facebook sorry, social media that are not attributed to anybody, because that is by, that's what I said by virtue of my training, any story that doesn't have the five WH, I don't give it any serious thought. And that's exactly the way I took the story when it first broke, because nobody really attributed to anybody. Uh, so such news don't give me any serious concern. But in and, terms of, uh, it but in terms just of very, issues, very unfortunate. In terms of issues such as this, I, I'm, I'm sorry Hello? to talk over you. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry to talk over you. But in terms of issues such as this, okay. where people, I mean, there were journalists in government house who. Um, um, actually witnessed when the government, uh, the governor and some of the people who were in government house uh, allegedly waiting for these girls to be returned because the federal government had assured them that these students would be returned on Sunday. Um, there are people who saw the government or uh, the governor leave government house and they were going to a certain destination. Could that have also maybe made them feel that the government were going to, you know, take receipt of these people that were kidnapped, especially the girls, from the school? If you have followed the story from the beginning, the federal government was not really involved in the negotiation or whatever discussion that geared towards releasing those girls. It's part of, uh, it's mainly uh, people from the state government and uh, possibly Sheikh Gumi, as I involved. So it wasn't the federal government. 
I, I, it's just very unfortunate. Because don't forget that uh, when the Kankara issue happened, even the, by the third day, people started moving, going about with story that 800 million have been released, and so those boys have been released. Uh, it turned out that nothing was released until much, much, much later. But it, it, I, I think what is very, very important here is that uh, there's the need for the purviors of fake news at this juncture, whatever might be their motive, they should apply the brakes because Nigeria is passing through a very difficult situation. And as individuals, as patriotic Nigerians, we shouldn't do anything that will aggravate the situation. Yes, some girls have been abducted. Efforts are on to release them. There's no way to raise people's adrenaline because uh, saying that they have been released when they have not been released. I, I think the main uh, source of information should be the governor or the government of Zafara State or the commissioner of police in that state. And that's what the government said, because the governor said, we are awaiting the release. And somebody went out and said they have been released, because there's a need for people to look at statements and take them one after the other. When the man said, we are waiting, that doesn't mean they have been released. Yeah. I think that was where the problem came. And the man came out and said, to the extent that even the commissioner of police had to come out later in the day to say, no, there was never any indication that these guys have been released, that everybody, people should disregard that rumor that those guys have been released. It is just necessary for all of us now to apply the brakes to be very cautious because Nigeria is passing through, passing through a very sensitive situation. And I'm, I'm sure that um, by us there, you mean us all, including us who are media practitioners, because some Everybody, of us fell prey to that everybody. story. All right, let me go, come to you, Barista Emmanuel. Um, the Emir, one of the Emirs in Zamfara State, the Emir of Anchor, um, during their visit to the governor uh, in the government house, berated Mr. President and the federal government in general, saying that they had failed in terms of security of the country um, and he who was appalled at the handling of these issues. And he wasn't just referring to what happened in Zamfara. He was talking about Kagara, Kankara, uh, and I mean, the list goes on. Um, why do you think that, or why does it seem that government is somewhat um, weak towards dealing with this issue of banditry? Well, um, there is a question that has been raving on the internet for a while. It is, if you are driving out of Lagos, for every 500 meters or one kilometer, you meet policemen, checkpoints, everywhere, all through. And it's worse in the east. Now, I still wonder how a crew of 200 children are carried and taken miles long into the forest. They pass through roads. These same people, they are, according to what the kids that were released said, they came in motorcycles. How such large number of people with guns would pass through all the checkpoints we have in Nigeria and get to a school and abduct children and take them into the forest, through the roads, into the forest. How do you explain that? How do you explain that? Where is our security? Where is our intelligence network? And it is when you are driving, you that is harmless, that the police will see you on the road and harass you and say, look, calm down. Where, where are your particulars? You give everything. They say, no, where is this, where is that? How do you have this? How? It's, it's, it's appalling. And the Emir, who knows, the, the federal government may want to push for his removal, but in the man has said the truth. Why, why, would, why, a, why, would, a, the, why would the federal state. government be pushing for an Emir's removal? It's not a political post, is it? Well, the Emir's have been removed. The Sultan of Sokoto was removed. The Oni of Ife was removed. Um, top emirs have been removed. But you see, because this it, it's, 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 it's appalling that the federal government does not seek any criticism as anybody that criticizes it as, it, as uh, um, a loyal Nigeria. I, it still beats me because these same people, when they were not in government, we're criticizing those that were in government. 
Okay, I'm going to ask. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask that question again. Why does it seem that the federal government is weak to dealing with the issue of banditry? Why does it seem that way, and why is it so difficult to deal with this as dealing with anything else in this country? Yeah, well, that is that's what we're saying. There is, it's like there are people that have been treated with kid gloves. Look at what has happened in Olu. The Air Force is bombarding Olu with all with the development with all with, with uh, houses in Olu, and you see you have children taking four hundred miles into the forest, and nobody, no, no security, no Air Force comes around. And these same people move in bikes because the people that were uh, kidnapped and, and released in, in the all the boys that were kidnapped and released. Tankara. The teacher said that these people came and the women, the, the, the travelers that were also kidnapped, that these people came in motorcycles and they took them into the forest that they were walking. Miles into the forest. How does that happen? Well, let's go. Do we to have two laws for the for different people in, uh, in this country? Well, let, let, let's go to what Governor Matawale had to say about um, the reasons or revelations as to why all the people who are behind these kidnappings in his state. He, he did say that um, the people that are, I mean, I'd, I'd, ra I'd rather say he was insinuating that the people who are behind these kidnappings are people who are unhappy with the gains of, you know, um, all the things that he's done in his state. He's also insinuating that um, these are some, some sort of, somewhat of his opponents, people who do not like the peace process that he's brought to Zamfara State. And it makes me really wonder, um, what are your thoughts when a governor of a state sounds like former President Goodluck Jonathan, who said that there might be Boko Haram members in his cabinet? If he knows these people, why well, can't he finger them? He's a chief security officer, see, the number one chief security officer of his state. So what is the challenge? You see, the, the challenge is this. We all play politics. We tell a lot of lies. If he knew the people, why does he not mention them? Their kids, their people, children's lives at stake. That's one. Moreover, from the, the audio message we got, the people who... Uh, um, um, uh, Sheikh Gumi met with the people who kidnapped the, the students. They said that the people, the politicians, the people who were there, were knew why they were kidnapping these people, these children, and they and that they are their sponsors. They said it. We know. We all. Everybody knows that these kidnappings, these uh, hoodlums, are the fallout of political contestations. How do you see a, a person who barely has a slippers that is, that you can, you can, a rubber slippers that is almost done, carried an AK-47. Is AK-47 sold for 20,000 or 10,000? That's, that, that's a How whole... How do they get this? That's a whole, that's a whole other conversation. But let me come back to you, Mr. Deepal Ayoko. Um, why would anybody play politics with the lives of school children? I mean, we play politics with a lot of things in this country, but why play politics with human lives, specifically children? And for a part of the country where we have so many out-of-school children, uh, a part of the country where we're trying to preach that education is for all, especially when 80% or 70% of the people who are out of school are a girl child, um, you know, um, so I'm thinking to myself, how does this even, how does this work, really? So an average politician, especially in Nigerian politics, everything is an avenue to play politics because the eye of the politician is on the next election. Even when he is in a disadvantaged position, he wants to turn it into an advantage. How do you recall that during the Niger Delta militant uh, saga, there was a day the former president, um, late Musashi Uyaradua, said we were going to release the list of those behind all those kidnappings. It's like at times in this country, we believe we pretend as if we forget our history. And up to today, that list has not been released. 
That is politics for you. Before the 2019 election, a former Minister of Defense, Dr. Antinati Waidanjuma, said Nigerians would be shocked, or Nigerians would not be able to sleep. I can't remember the word that if he used, or the word she used, if he reveals all that he knows about Nigeria. Up to today, he has not released those secrets. Now we have a governor who has been negotiating, so to speak, with bandits. Mm -hmm. And across the country, people have been crying blue murder. Why should you be doing this? All of a sudden, he has come out to say, people, those who are not happy, you have to understand what he said. He said, those who are not happy with the successes he has recorded through his negotiation with the bandits are the one behind the new or recent kidnapping. I think we are waiting for him to reveal the secrets, those who are behind it. But like I told you, it's going to be an endless wait. But it is very, very ironic that we have a situation like this and the governor is talking like this. Let us hope he has the list. I wish he would release the list. Now you ask the question, a country where you have, a, a, a place where you have about 30 million children out of school, some people have put hindrances, still put hindrances in, on the way of education. But you should know how terrorists operate. Terrorists operate where they think they will have least or no resistance at all. Terrorists operate where they think they will make headline, um, headlines. Mm. You know what happened in the case of the cheaper girls? That was the major kidnap, we can talk of school, school children. You know how the team projected Boko Haram to the whole world? Almost every head of state, almost every president and their first lady were carrying placards, uh, free cheaper girls. It gave them a mileage. It gave them that exposure as spread. So that's exactly what is happening now, what is happening in the case of what we are witnessing, whether it is Kankara or Kangara or Jambele. So you do, a, so, so you do agree. And if you have been to... Uh, so you do yes, agree. You are saying something. Yes, so you do agree that these people, these bandits are somewhat following the footsteps of the people that we have termed terrorists. And there might not be any difference between them and these terrorists if they're copycats of the... <laughs> There's no two way about it. it is, they are terrorists. Because their models of brandy show that they are terrorists. What happens? You go into a school. You abduct innocent school children. You subjected them to that torture. I was about saying that. If you know the terrain of the north very well, you can move within in the north for five hours inside the bush without coming to the main road. Hmm. I am telling you because I have had the experience, especially between 2018 and 2019. You can move inside the bush. There, there, there is a man, I can't remember whether, I can't remember if he's an engineer or a professor. He said something happened. They abducted him, they took him into the forest. That when they released him, it took him five hours of trekking to get to the main road. That is the terrain. And unfortunately, we have, the, the barrister just raised a very good question, select question. Some people who are carrying AK-47, you know how much it costs to, to purchase an AK-47? Some people who have been paid ransom money to the tune of 200 million, 300 million. And this thing was the same thing Senator Sherry Sonny said. If you look at the totality of that man, what he is putting on is not up to 2,000 naira. Where is the money? Where are the 100 millions that they have been collecting? Definitely some people are profiting from this business. Like I was telling a friend, a friend, this thing has become like a federal character. It started from Niger Delta, where we were we've been kidnapped, hundreds of millions were being attacked, were, were being demanded. Some people, the government officials, so to speak, allegedly, will go and collect money from government, go and give these guys just a pittance. After the amnesty thing came in, they came to the southwest. They had tried it on two schools around the Kurodu area until the state government and noted, until the state government and local Pujilante people said, no, we are not going to take this any longer. They did not wait for the federal government. The federal government only came to stop, to complement what they are doing. Because to some extent, this type of insecurity has to be dealt with with local means. Local means. Huh. People who know the terrain, like in the case of Kurodu, they were using the water to reach the school. Because they will not come to the main road. People will see them. They were using the waters. 
So people who know the terrain very well were able to say, no, we are going to put a stop to, to this. Now, the point is, what are the political vigilante in that area doing? People who know the terrain of the bushes and the forest that knows where these people are moving. So I, I, I think there is a need for the governor, instead of talking about those people behind it, those who are not happy because he has been reaching agreement with bandits, let him release the list to us. Let us see those people who are not happy. But what I tell you is that there is no amount of negotiation the way they are going about it that will appease these boys. Hmm. Interesting. Because even though even though Sheikh yeah. Gumi, even though Sheikh Gumi is saying that a dialogue, a negotiation is the best line of action for them to down their arms, you're saying that that cannot happen. If you look at what Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Gumi said, he said general uh, general amnesty. It is not only dialogue. General amnesty. Now, whatever crime you might have committed, we are forgiving you. That is what he's saying. Which is going to be very, very hard. When you are negotiating with bandits, the government always negotiates with the point of strength, not the, from the point of weakness. You bombard them so that this is to know, to know what we are capable of doing. If you don't succumb, this is what we are going to do for you. But we're going to give you a window of surrendering. That is how to negotiate, not to go to them as if you are begging them. Ah, how can you beg them? They will not pass or render. You must negotiate from the position of strength. That is what negotiation means all over the world. Whether it's in America, it is with the Taliban, it is in Israel. Look at what happened in the case of Israel. When, the increase, when one top Israeli commander was abducted, you know, America, Israel, while he was negotiating with them, was bombarding them. But at the end of the day, they released the Israeli, they released some uh, high top uh, commander of this um, Palestinian uh, terrorist group, so to speak. So the government everywhere negotiates from the point of strength. Okay. No government will, put a, will negotiate from the point of weakness and you allow those guys to submit their arms. You don't. While you are negotiating, you also let them know what we are capable of doing. You are like okay. you have the jet fighters hovering over them that if you don't succumb, this is what we are going to do. But because you are Nigerians, we believe that you have misbehaved. We want to call you back like a photo person. We don't behave, then we deal with you. Okay, let me come back to you, Barista Mano. Um he made a statement about negotiating from a point of strength. Have the Nigerian government really displayed that point, that strength? Because there have been so many people calling for the head of the federal government. So many, I mean, before now we were talking about service chiefs and their incapability of handling the situation. And now we have new service chiefs. One would expect that there would be swift actions. We would be, would have better intel. Uh, they would be 10 steps ahead of these terrorists, but that doesn't seem to be a case, uh, the case right now. So um, what, what, where do you think the government is going to stand? I mean, the federal government has already said, we're not doing, we're not negotiating with these bandits. It's not going to happen. And over the weekend, they had asked that Mr. President be the one to lead the dialogue. So where does this leave us, the Nigerian state, the government of the people, and these bandits, because you, this seems to be a continuous see, cycle that is unending. Who knows what school's going to be next? You see, I think um, the major problem we have, you see, it's like uh, when, during the American presidential debates, and Donald Trump was asked to, to ask the, uh, the boys, the, uh, the people who uh, were, uh, raising a lot of problems in the U.S. to denounce them. And it's, it, instead of denouncing them, he told them to stand by. Now, recollect when this banditry started in, in Benway. And the, the headsmen and the, and the, and the farmers uh, uh, clashes. The president made a statement, which is very, very profound. He said the Benway state people should, should accommodate the headsman, that if he did not join the army, he would have been one of them. How does your commander in chief say that? Well, that the, the, the president is not here to are, defend himself, so I'll play are, the devil's advocate. The president probably was talking about herders having issues with farmers, you know, not necessarily bandits. No, well, the people, if you carry guns and kill people, you see, I don't understand what we, why we give names to, to, uh, to, 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 to criminals. You see a person has, has killed somebody, you now call the person a cultist. Instead of calling him a murderer, 
a person who rapes somebody, instead of calling the person a rapist, you call him a courtist. Or somebody is, 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 is committing armed robbery, we say he's a, 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 a headsman or a bandit. You get? These people are criminals. There's no law, there's, there are laws against us carrying weapons in Nigeria. You, the law, you can only be permitted to, to carry hunting rifles, not assault weapons. It's only the, the military that's allowed to carry assault weapons in Nigeria. So if somebody, it, it's, a, it's a law of strict application. If you are found with weapon in Nigeria, you are charged and you can be convicted for just holding a weapon or even holding a bullet. How come we now ask the people that are carrying guns are bandits and uh, oh, you have to go and negotiate with them? You have, like my, 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 my friend said, you, 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 you start from the weak point. It beats me. It beats me. Huh. So this is the, is the core problem in our country. We, 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 we deodorize crime. Interesting. We treat crime as if it is not because it's a particular group of people are doing that. All right. The, the former chief of army staff said at the Senate hearing, that this thing has been there for over 30 years. Hmm. Let this me crisis, this thing has been there, but the people were keeping quiet. Now it has now come home to roost. In closing, gentlemen, like because, said, be, because we're out of time, sorry. I'll just I'll just put out this question. Oh. Do you want to say something? Just quickly say it. Just quickly say it. Yes, please. I was in in your best state in the 90s. There was no state that was as peaceful as that state. Today, no commissioner of police wants to go to Yobe State anymore. No military man wants to go to Yobe State because the people have been militarized. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we are running, we are, we are playing with fire. All right, in closing, I'm going to ask this question to both you and um, Mr. Olayoko. Uh, we seem to be spending more time and energy in trying to retrieve people who have been abducted. Like I said earlier on in the conversation, why do we not have some form of plan to stay ahead of these guys, knowing that what they're doing is replicating the same thing over and over again in different um, different areas, you know, from Z Kagara to Zamfara. So why are our security agencies not at least five steps, if not ten steps ahead of them? Because we seem to be spending more money and time and energy trying to get... In fact, there's a swift response these days as to how soon and how fast we can retrieve them. Why don't we channel that same energy into making sure that our schools are policed? What can we do to make sure that, I know again that the security agencies are overstretched, but how do we make sure that these ungoverned spaces are no longer ungoverned? I'll start with you, Mr. Layoko. I, I think uh, what the governors need to do, and I they emphasize because I'm talking of our experience in the Niger Delta area, it was the governors were at the, at the forefront of how to quell that thing, whatever means they used. I remember that sometime in Anambra, in uh, Imbo, when this ugly head, sorry, uh, we had it, uh, the governor then knew how he put an end to it. I will just mention to you what happened in Lagos State and, so, and how the thing was quickly, life was quickly snubbed out of it. In this type of insecurity that we are having, local I mean, security, the local aspect of security system has to be aggravated now. It has to be activated. Because if you know some of these schools, I'm very happy you said our security agencies, our agents are overstretched. What is the strength of our military? They are less than 400,000. What of the police? They are less than 400,000. And if you know the length and breadth of the north, how can you police the whole of this north? How can you police the entire... I'm sorry, gentlemen. I'm sorry, gentlemen. We're out of time. I'm really so sorry. I, I apologize. I apologize, Mr. Layoku. Thank you very much, Mr. Emmanuel Moran. Thank you, gentlemen. We have to wrap things up because we have to go and have another conversation with our next guest. Um, Dikpa Olayoku is a broadcast journalist and Emmanuel Moran is a legal practitioner. Thank you, gentlemen, it's for being always, part it's of the always a pleasure. All right. Thank you, John. Thank you for having me. Well, Thank you all for staying with us. We'll take a short break and when we return, we'll be speaking with Sheikh...
Gumi, of course, he's going to be talking about the negotiations with bandits terrorizing the country. Stay with us.